Well, good morning. And uh, in terms of responding to, to Jean Pascal, um, there's nothing, of course, I can respond to. He has laid it out so clearly for you, uh, very explicitly, and uh, in, in a great deal of skill. So what I would like to do is, is essentially bring you down to the scale of action, bring you down to the scale of Ireland, if at all possible. I think uh, yesterday, one of the speakers introduced uh, Mary Robinson by talking about Seamus Heaney and mentioning one of his quotes, and it's become de rigueur in a lot of uh, conferences to, to start with a quote from the great Seamus Heaney. Here's mine, um, which I like very much, and I think is very appropriate to today. The world where we are to make our tarry art lies before us. And in a sense, that's what we're discussing today, the kind of arc we're going to build to take the people that come after us into the future. What kind of shape will that take? And what kind of uh, decisions will we make today and will we make in the next few years at a scale of Ireland? Um, Jean has been looking uh, quite a lot at the sort of changes which have been happening at a global scale. And of course, those changes, uh, when you express them in terms of averages, don't necessarily bring you down to the scale of uh, the contrast that occur, for example, between land and sea, between different continents. And you can see from the warming trend here over the past century or so, the extent to which the land masses of the world have warmed much more quickly than the oceans, the extent to which the high latitudes have warmed more quickly uh, than the oceans. And uh, when you look at Ireland in a location, for example, on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, you realise that maybe we haven't seen the more extreme changes that have affected many other parts of the world. But nevertheless, there are some interesting statistics uh, which uh, John has already quoted to you, and I just want to give you one more. And the one more I want to give you is at the very bottom of the slide. I don't think you'll be able to read it very well there. But it says if you're in the audience today, and if you're under 30 years of age, then you've never experienced a month on this planet when the average surface temperature was less than the average temperature of the entire 20th century for that month. So we're in exceptional times, and we're in times when climate is changing. And Ireland is a mid-latitude country. You would expect, of course, to see the kind of changes on average that are happening in the rest of the world. And certainly, in the case of temperature, you can see that is very clearly happening. The global trend on the top showing the very distinctive early century warming, the pause during the middle of the century, and then the more rapid changes of the past 30, 40 years, mirrored by the Irish temperature trend here at the bottom, showing a very close correspondence between the global trend and that which we've seen in Ireland. So when we're talking about Ireland, uh, climate is already changing. It's already underway. And it's underway at the same kind of magnitude in global terms, sorry, in, in temperature terms, as is happening globally. If you take any location in Ireland, and compare the 30-year averages from 1961-90 to the more recent ones from 1981-2010, you can see almost all parts of Ireland have warmed by about a half degree. So climate change is not something that's happening out there in Africa, out there in Asia, in the rest of the world. We're already underway and well underway with what's happening uh, in, in terms of our own climate here in Ireland. And that's the present. What about the future? Well, when we look at the future and we model, uh, as we have done here in Maynooth, for the, for the temperature trend for the next 30 years or so, you can see that that half degree warming is going to continue. It's probably going to be exacerbated in many parts of the island. Uh, you can see the red um, marks here. Um, I wouldn't go too much with the spatial contrast, but looking at the quantitative changes, which we're quite confident about, you can see many places in Ireland will warm between one and one and a half degrees over the next 30 years by comparison to the 1961-90 averages. So we're underway, and those changes are quite robustly uh, replicated by any model, climate model, that we can generate for Ireland. With temperature, we're very confident. And indeed, in Ireland, a degree or so won't make too much of a difference to the way we organize our lives in Ireland. Temperature is not the critical variable for us here on this island. What is critical is the rainfall changes. 
And we have less confidence in the way we can predict those, but nevertheless, there is a great deal of model agreement uh, that, for example, we will see in the winter time a lot more rain uh, in the west of Ireland in particular. We will see, by contrast, a lot less rain in the east of Ireland. Uh, the blue uh, marking that out here as well. And those are key variables for us in organising future society here in Ireland. Uh, we have, of course, a problem in the west of Ireland that we don't really want more rain in the winter time in the west of Ireland. And we have a problem in the east of Ireland where our people and our cities are that we may actually be suffering from water shortages in the years ahead. So when we feed in those uh, changes in climate into models of river flow, for example, uh, into models of stream flow here for the, the Boyne, we can see modest changes beginning to appear by the 2020s. We can see that by the middle of the century, uh, they're becoming more marked with uh, wetter winter giving rise to more, uh, rain, more stream flow uh, in wintertime and less in the summertime. And we can see by the end of the century the way in which we now have an emerging problem of increased flood problem uh, in the wintertime uh, and decreased rainfall and decreased water availability in the summertime. And maybe we're seeing some of that, of course, in the last few years. We've seen problems of increased flooding in many parts of Ireland. These kind of scenes we've become rather blasé about. We see them in many winters, uh, extreme events which have been exacerbated in many cases by uh, poor planning policies and by a lack of protection. And we've seen those in, indeed in some even of our major cities which have been flooded um, by a combination of climate and, and poor water management policies. So we have an, a, a quite clear signal that those kind of changes are underway for the future in our winter rainfall regime, which we have to start adapting to. We also have an emerging problem of, of uh, water shortage in the summer, and we will have to make hard decisions as water stress conditions build up in some of our uh, eastern cities in particular as to how we manage water supplies, when we need to invest in new infrastructure, what will be the effects of conservation, what will be the effects of fixing leaks. Those kind of decisions we will have to be making in the future very quickly and, and very robustly indeed to cope with what's coming down the line. And we know also that those kind of shocks of climate are, which are now affecting us, uh, have affected us more recently in terms of food production, in terms of agriculture. 500 million was the cost of the fodder crisis a few, a few springs ago. Those kind of shocks are not going to go away as climate changes in Ireland as well. So again, we have to take them on board. But perhaps the most immediate in, in impact that we expect to see will be in the incidence of storms. We're on the edge here of the great battleground zone between tropical and polar air masses. We're right in the center of activity of the storm tracks of the North Atlantic. And we know that the jet stream, which determines our winter storm conditions, can get locked in position as it did a couple of winters ago here, locking in position over Ireland and producing a flow of really extreme storm events which affected us uh, for a very severe winter in 2013. Now when climate changes, it's often those extremes that manifest themselves first. And it's often the unlikely combination of events which becomes more frequent. Uh, problems happen not because of one thing going wrong in our climate system, but when several things coincide. And we know that a couple of winters ago, we had the coincidence of very deep storms coming across in that locked jet stream. We had the storm arriving at the coast uh, at the same time as the storm surge, it was driving ahead of it. Uh, and of course, we know that low pressure systems cause a local elevation in sea level while they pass over a place because the air is not pushing down in the ocean. And that local rise in sea level is about one centimetre for every one millibar fall or one hectopascal fall in air pressure. So if you have a 950 millibar or 950 hectopascal depression, you're looking right away at 50 centimetres or so of, a, of a, an elevated sea level as that passes over you. And when that coincidence of unfavourable probabilities occur, uh, perhaps in conjunction with a very high tide, as we know happened as well in many of those storm incidences, then we get the, the disastrous events, events, the catastrophic events, 
the events which produced that uh, really bad winter of a couple of uh, winters ago, which we're now very familiar with, these kinds of scenes around our coast, um, where we had a 25 metre wave off the south coast, for example, uh, in 2000 and early 2014. So those kinds of uh, changes, five, oh, <laughs> those kind of changes are quite severe. I'm going to have to go very quickly. And we know that, um, we, know that uh, we had those kinds of extreme events. We know also that we're going to be affected not in the same way by heat waves as other parts of the world. Um, but we have here one particular instance of the warmest day of the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, in uh, 1983, and you can see the correspondence between mortality in Ireland and temperature in Ireland here. Quite clearly, uh, we have a, a, an emerging problem if we get those kinds of events more frequently as well. We're also going to get problems for our landscapes, and we know that many of our landscapes depend on moisture, especially in, in the summertime. We know that many of our landscapes are controlled by sea level, we know that many of our landscapes will not, well, not cater well for a rising temperature, especially in high altitude areas. And this is unfortunately how we look after some of those great carbon stores that many of those landscapes provide. Uh, not only do we neglect them, but we in fact burn them, which makes matters uh, a lot worse. We know that many of our cultural icons in terms of our natural biodiversity are also going to change quite drastically. Uh, species which are at their limits, southern limits, in many parts of, of, of Ireland are going to fall prey to warming temperatures, for example. And other species which we don't want to see coming into Ireland, invading Ireland uh, and uh, effectively damaging our natural biodiversity. Just one minute on some of the, the work we've been doing recently on pest species, because some of those will respond very rapidly to changes in temperature. Some of our indigenous pests, such as pine weevils here, um, which damage our forestry, our long-term crop, which we have to expect to be around in 60, 70 years' time. Others will make their way into Ireland. Uh, this is the um, horse chestnut leaf miner. Um, looks lovely, but in fact this is what it does to horse chestnuts, and the eradication rate is 2% at the moment. And I mention this one because it was first detected way back in 1984 only in Macedonia. And since that time, it's made its way all through Europe, it's made its way across the English Channel, it's made its way through England, and at the moment it's in Hollyhead waiting for the boat. So um, we, have, we have emerging problems with longer term ones such as the pine processionary moth which causes health problems, uh, which makes it difficult to walk in pine forests in many parts of the continent without uh, risking these kinds of rashes and so on, but more seriously damages our forestry. And we have problems in elevated water tables, which may affect planning quite considerably in Ireland in terms of contaminating our water assets, contaminating our water uh, aquifers. Uh, so we have to manage our rainfall regime changes with our aquifer vulnerability and our soil permeability issues to guide planning policies and try and avoid those issues. But more importantly, we have a cost to pay. If we get our issues wrong at the moment, we will have huge costs in infrastructural resources. This railway has already been moved once to avoid coastal erosion. Now with elevated sea levels, maybe higher storm surges, it will have to be moved again. So we have decisions to make about how we spend money in the future. And those decisions are increasingly being guided by very much more powerful weapons in terms of data sources. We can now plot how many people live at certain heights above sea level. Uh, we can match up the kinds of addresses and numbers and the kinds of costs that they might face uh, with an individual storm flood event. And you can see, for example, for, uh, for Dublin here, there are about 40,000 addresses uh, above, uh, less than about five metres above sea level. Those kinds of once-off events, we can calculate out how much would they cost in insurance claims. And very quickly, you see, the cost of doing nothing on climate change can reach a billion very quickly from an individual event in terms of coastal flooding. So the cost of doing nothing, which is often not mentioned in control measures, the cost of doing nothing is potentially huge in many parts of Ireland. And for that reason, the EU is 
moving towards a policy of marked reductions uh, in total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's not going to cost the Earth. It will cost less than 0.1% of GNP to get down to those levels. And many countries are being very progressive about moving towards uh, reductions which are very marked. The UK is a very powerful climate law. Scotland has gone even further than required. It's now uh, looking for a 42% reduction in 2020 uh, emissions. Uh, it's already at 33% of that, so it's making good progress. Other countries are pushing out the boat as well. And Ireland should be among those because we are among the highest greenhouse gas emitters in the world on a per capita basis because of our industrial and agricultural sectors. So we have more culpability for climate change, more responsibility for climate justice than most other countries in the world. And unfortunately, of course, our projections for emissions are increasing uh, and our actual requirements for reductions will cross over those increases very shortly, within one or two years, leaving us open to the possibility of sanctions from our European colleagues as we breach the solemn undertakings that we made in 2009. So how far are we along this road of climate justice in Ireland? Have I got a minute? Good. <laughs> um, well, uh, we've seen a number of commitments to legislation. We've seen about four climate bills come and go and fa fall at the last minute. The most recent one has, uh, was actually introduced uh, uh, as a result of a commitment on the pro in the programme for government in 2011. Uh, it has gone to the Joint Oireachtas Committee. A report has been issued with recommendations. Those recommendations have now gone to committee level and unfortunately, by and large, have been uh, rejected. The main weaknesses of our approach, sectoral targets not included, uh, the expert advisory committee not independent and the inclusion of climate justice not mentioned. And despite efforts to try and put amendments on those particular characteristics, uh, I have to say that uh, in the last two weeks, including an amendment on climate justice uh, was rejected by, by government. So we're not seeing the response that we want, the political leadership that we want, the political leadership that Tejan talked about a moment or two ago. And that's by and large because the winners and losers in terms of our emissions in the future are being largely decided behind our backs to some extent. Uh, we know that by 2050 our energy systems are due to be decarbonized. Our transport systems are due to be decarbonized. Uh, our residential systems are due to be decarbonized. Think of what that means for cars, for houses, for energy systems. So the cake in 2050 is in fact all going to one sector. Uh, and that's uh, an issue which I think has to be debated and have a conversation about. So finally, we have this dichotomy, which I think Jean talked about of, uh, we're very good at making aspirational things. We're very good about noble causes. And you can see a lovely speech here on the left by the Taoiseach as he went to the United Nations in September. It could be straight out of the, uh, the, our own songbook on climate justice here. It could be really a noble speech. But when it comes to the crunch, national self-interest always trumps uh, global community good. And you can see the other side of the speech here a few weeks later, going to Europe, arguing for national self-interest as the only dominant thing to worry about. So we have to overcome. And this is something that's not unique to any political leader. It's embedded in us all to some extent that we have to overcome. So my controversial bit at the end that Anne talked about here, to put the blood pressure up a bit, um, uh, maybe to sum up what I feel is our own issue on climate justice here in terms of the three pillars of the negotiations that are currently going on in Europe. First thing is what I might call better than Brazil. Uh, because we produce uh, food better and more efficiently than some countries, we argue we're a special case. Germany argues it's a special case for car production. Italy argues it's a special case for wine production. We want special treatment here as well. Secondly, count the hedges. Um, if we can find anything at all to offset against our increased emissions, uh, can, we, can we make the rules bendable to include them and to get ourselves a get-out-of-jail-free card for uh, not doing what we should be doing, which is mitigation? And last, unfortunately, freeload in other countries' efforts. 
Are we negotiating? And some press releases suggest we've already negotiated a burden which is much less than our fellow countries in Europe are undertaking uh, for the 2030 period. And that's where I think we have to question, is this an acceptable climate justice approach that we should be taking? So I'll leave you with uh, some of the principles that I think uh, climate justice involves. Uh, precautionary principle, equity, common but differentiated responsibility, and most importantly, the polluter pays principle. Uh, that's the, the one I think we have to look at most carefully. And of course, we've mentioned intergenerational equity. But to leave on a rather pessimistic note, I think without fundamental reorganization and reform of our political system and institutions, we're not going to face up to this challenge of climate justice effectively. We have to face it head on. We have to face the vested interest groups down. And we have to achieve the leadership we need at political level to overcome this major problem. Thank you.